I thank you, and I'm so lucky, honored to be here today. I am a Holocaust survivor, as you know, and my name is Annie Bleiberg. Well, I'm here today, and I'm lucky to be here, and I thank you for coming here. And, well, I will speak. I'll try to tell my story, my survival story during the Holocaust era, which means September 1st, 1939 started for me when Hitler attacked Poland. And before that, Hitler made a pact with the Russian, with the neighbor, Polish neighbor from the east, and divided Poland into two. The western part he took for himself, occupied by himself, and the eastern part he gave over to the Russians. We, my family and I, just lived on that newly created border on the west side. And about four weeks later, which means the beginning of October or the end of September in 39, we were expelled. All the Jews from the newly created border were expelled from the German side to the Russians. We were amongst them. At the time, we were very lucky because my grandfather lived on the other side of the border and we stayed in my grandfather's house. I was born there, a small town, Oleszice, but we lived in a big city and I got my education in Yaroslav, which was a nice big city, not like New York, but a big city. Well, most of those people who were expelled from the western side of that border were taken by the Russians the same winter to Siberia. While life was very hard and hard work and not much food, and Siberia, the cold air, the cold weather and a lot of snow, more than we have here today, survived. I had cousins who were taken to Siberia and they came back after the war and came to the United States. Also, they are gone now, unfortunately. They were much older than I. Well, the same Hitler who made a pact with the Russian in 1929, just before the war started, before he attacked Poland, attacked the Russians. The Russians, too, weren't prepared, just like Poland wasn't, and marched in and marched over all eastern part of Poland and way into the Russian territory and going north to Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and so on. And the war was getting harder also by the minute for Hitler, too. Why? Hitler's army wasn't dressed properly for the cold weather. There were no roads for the heavy machinery of Hitler's army, and there was no oil, no gas. So while they put up a fierce fighting around Petersburg or Leningrad, that's a big old city in Russia, meant they had to turn or start to turn back. And while his army had to turn back and was turning back and had a lot of casualties, Hitler but put all <coughs> excuse me, put all his energy to annihilate, to kill the Jews wherever he put steps on. And for us there was like Bobby that people Jews were really uh, digging their own graves and they were shot at random and fell into that ravine. But that was too expensive for Hitler and too much time consuming. So a big educated conference was in, in, in Berlin and they came up with the idea, unbelievable, with the idea of mass murder. Mass murder by gas and burning the, the corpses. And so sprung up a lot, a lot of camps. Dead camps, well, the concentration camps were basically for work. 
and say the Hitler, the Nazis worked you to death. Was hard work, little food, getting up in the morning early and just working. And you were going, you were escorted to work from the camp, to work and from work with German soldiers, Nazi soldiers and dogs. And many times, many a times, you just did not know who was more vicious, the dogs or the soldiers. I, for one, like I said, we were lucky in the beginning. We stayed in my grandfather's house. Yes, we have lost everything, but we were in familiar surroundings. Life wasn't easy. There were rules and regulations against the Jews, but also against the Gentiles, let's not forget. They, like the Gentiles, the Jews and the Gentiles, could not walk after dark, could not assembly, synagogues were burned, books were burned, there were bonfires done in the middle of the city, and people, Jews, had to dance around them or over the fire. It was awful, more than awful, scary and awful. And yet at this time I would say nobody but nobody believed or imagined that the Germans, that Hitler could come up with an idea of mass murder like killing Jews by gas and burning the bodies. Nobody could imagine that a country, that people, the Germans, who lived a better standard of living before the war than other European countries, who had a better education than any other countries in Europe before the war, could come up with ideas like that including our own government here in the United States. Well, in order to accomplish that, Hitler put all the Jews first in ghettos, which were more either a part of a big city or another one town or a part of that town was designated for the ghetto. And here, again, circumstances, living conditions were subhuman. There was not enough food, there was no heat, and it was cold, it was winter, and there were no medicine, no doctors, no hospitals, anything. And in the ghetto, when you walked out in the morning, there were more dead bodies laying in the street than able bodies to take care of those bodies. Well, we too were sent after about a year and a half, when we too were sent to the ghetto, to the nearby city, Ghetto Lubachov. And these were the circumstances, what I just was talking about. Young people, especially young men, were taken away to working camps, and you never heard or saw them again. You had to work, menial works, in, on the roads to clean, or whatever, and you had to do it. The, and you say, why did you do it? Or why didn't you really rebel? Yes, there were always small rebels. And, but to no avail. Hitler was very strong, very organized, and did his job even, uh, did his job to kill Jews and fast even on the account of his own soldiers. He des Hitler designated more trains to take the Jews from the ghettos to the concentration camps, to the death camps, more camps than the camps to bring his wounded soldiers back home. We were in uh, Lubachov ghetto, and after about three months, the 12th hour also rang out for that ghetto, and the ghetto was to be liquidated. At the time, Hitler was getting a real beaten and very lo big losses at Leningrad, what I mentioned. At the time, we hoped 
we hope that the war will end within two or three months. And who wouldn't want to live two or three months? As for us, my family, we had Gentile Christian families, good friends that always were there to help us. If it's for a slice of bread or a few potatoes or whatever, even for shelter. And that was punishable with that. So I want you to know, even in the worst of times, there were always good people, people willing uh, to help, which, with whatever they could. Well, when we were designated, when the ghetto Lubachov was designated to be liquidated, and I must say, at the time, we didn't know that they will be liquidated completely. We just thought that whoever's going to be caught and sent out to the camp, to the death camp, we, and the rest will remain and go on living if you can call that living. But here again, the war was almost ending, and it did, from that time on, it did last two and a half horrible years. I must confess, if I would have known, or my family would have known, that it lasts so long, maybe I wouldn't have jumped from the train, and I'll mention that right after, Maybe I wouldn't even be here today. But we all thought the war is ending soon, and life is worth fighting for. L I hope you'll never c be in a situation like that. But even if you have some minor, and I say minor, misfortunes, do not give up. Tomorrow, the sun will shine. You have to have hope, because if you lose hope, you have lost everything. So even in bad times, try to overcome, try to make the best of it, try again and again, and you'll succeed eventually. If not 100%, maybe 80 or 90%. And then you'll try some more. But be happy and keep trying, and keep working, and keep hoping. And good luck. You need good luck. Well, we thought that the ghetto will be just partially liquidated. My father took along with him some tools to open the little crates and the boards of those little windows on top. And one by one, when the train started to roll, st the people started to jump out. My father was the first of the men, and I was the first of the girls, because we made lines on one side the men and one side the girls. And how lucky can you get? And I'm talking now for myself. There was one man left yet to be jumped when the train stopped. The German soldiers were looked in and they saw that they weren't so filled as they, from the, as they were from the beginning. But they figured the Jews will not escape. Sooner or later, they all will be annihilated. They all will be gone from the earth of, the, of Europe, maybe even some of Africa, or his his plans were grandiose. But when the train started again, that young man got scared, and he said to me, you jump first, and he'll jump after me. Well, I jumped first. My mother helped me, and although I don't remember if we said anything to each other, I, it's 70 some years, because that was in January 1943, and, but I still remember, I still feel my mother's hand on my body pushing me up because the window was above my head. She pushed me up, I wiggled through that little opening, which you call window, for the kettle, not for people, 
and I took a hold of the rail where the doors are sliding to open and close, let go, and fell to the ground. And the ground was all covered with a heavy blanket of snow. It was cold. I fell down. I lost my memory. I lost my whereabouts. I laid there like a lump sum. And I didn't know about my situation. I also didn't feel anything. And then a shot rang out very close and very strong. And I picked myself up, which was a great mistake. But I was lucky. Because so long I was laying as a lump sum in a dark coat on the white snow, the Germans thought I was dead and I was OK. But once I got up and started to move, I was already, I was already a target for the Germans. But I wasn't. I was lucky. The only, I didn't know where I was. I was never there. I didn't but know how I got there or why I got there. The only thing I knew, I remembered, was that my father said to me, if the train goes one way, you go the opposite way. And so not thinking much, I couldn't. I didn't know what thinking means. I turned around and I walked. And from far enough, I saw a little light. And I walked to that light. And that shows you how much unaware I was of the situation. I walked straight into that little boot. There was a watch boot on the tracks. And I was lucky enough, because there was a Polish man, the watchman, and he didn't have to ask me who I was. I had a bleeding nose. And there was just a Jewish cargo. This is how they called the Jewish people ta being taken to their death, to their last destination, Belzitz. That Belzitz was a dead camp on arrival. In the beginning, the people were guests in the kettle cars. Later, the bodies pulled out and burned in the open. At this point, ninth, beginning 43, Hitler was not afraid, afraid of the world. Hitler was not afraid for anybody and anything. And everything was open. We knew what happened in Belzec, because the people who lived in that city, Belzec, saw it, know it, and they were talking. And they came back to us. But there was nothing one can do. Yes, some young people were going into the woods. Some young people were forming an underground. That was also a group of my, that my future husband was involved uh, in. But in mess, you couldn't do anything. You needed England, America, and the Russian to finally beat Hitler. He was prepared. The other countries had prepared while the war was still going on. And so I walked into that booth, and that man, that Polish watchman, said to me, you can't stay here. If a German soldier or Polish policeman will walk in, they'll kill you. But how much that re registered, how much I understood of it, I didn't know. The boot was two by nothing, and I didn't know how to turn to get even out. So he took me by my hand, and he said, don't go with the tracks. They are hoodlums. They'll beat you up. They'll kill you. They'll take your coat. You'll freeze to death. Go with the road. And it was just around the corner. It was a road that was leading to little villages or the outskirts of the city Lubachov. I was a stranger there. I came from Yaroslav. I was never there and didn't know where I am. But while I was walking, a woman sprung up somehow. I didn't know who she was. I still don't know who she was. But we walked together. 
she knocked on doors and windows to many of the homes, and the answer was, go away, I am afraid. And finally, but we got to one household, there was a tall man standing in the doorway with a lantern. I don't remember if he said anything or no, but he let us in. I do remember how the things looked inside, and he gave us each a potato, cold potato, baked, cooked, whatever. The best potato I have ever eaten in my life. After a while, that human, superhuman man who gave us a little shelter said, you have to leave. I had a wristwatch on and I offered him just to let us stay in the barn with the cows or anywhere, but to stay till the morning. We were for about three days gathered together in a warehouse before we were shipped to the, the uh, pushed on the, the train and we were tired and hungry, but he said no. He again showed his humanity. Keep the watch, he said. You might need it for a piece of bread, but I, he can't keep us because if a German soldier or Polish policeman sees us daytime, walking out from his house, will be killed, he'll be killed, or maybe his family too. So we had to leave and we got back to the, we got back to the ghetto Lubachov. We walked in into some houses, they were open and cold and eerie, and that woman remained in one of those houses because she was shut in a leg and couldn't walk anymore. I, I was destined to go to the other side of the ghetto where we lived during the ghetto existence. And we made, we, my family made up, whoever, whoever by remote chance will survive that ride, that ordeal, we shall come back. We believe that the ghetto will still go on. And as I got to the place and here again, here the first time, I started to feel uneasy, scary, and I was even afraid to sit down on a chair there. I walked, wanted and walked up eventually to the attic. And my father did build a safe, so to say, a safe place, a hiding place. And as soon as I got there and sat down, I heard heavy boots coming up to the attic. And that was the first time here again that I really, really got scared. I figured somebody saw me, I had to make a light because I couldn't see in the, and I wasn't familiar to do it in the dark. But my father came up with a friend. I, he spoke up and I recognized his voice. Well, I said, father, I'm here. There was a bit of sweet reunion. We sat down all three in that hiding place. And during the day, some police, German soldiers came up to look for some leftover Jews, hiding yet Jews. And they would have find us because they did Friday and that was already probably Monday morning or so. But one of them said, let's go. I took him all out Friday and that saved us because they surely would have found us and they surely would have taken us out and killed right there and then. We stayed there over the day and at night we went back to Oloshitze to our dear friend, the Kozis, Anielka and Mikolai Koji. We were, when I was a little girl, we were friends, and we were friends later too, but we were friends and neighbors. And they offered us shelter before the action, before the, 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 the thing started. But my mother was sick and she didn't want to go. She knew exactly where she is going, where we are all going. But this is what she said. I only will be a hindrance to you. So you go, hide yourself, do everything to live. I'll go where Hitler will take me. 
but we as a family couldn't do it. So I spoke up because I was the older of the two sisters, of the two girls, and I said, no, we'll go all where Hitler's taken us, but in the last minute when nobody, nobody can help each other, then we'll try our utmost, and we did. My father survived, lived till a nice ripe age of 93, passed away a few years ago, and I survived. My mother did not try even, I don't think so, neither did my sister. And I often think and I often wonder, what did my mother say to my sister when she came back after helping me to jump? She believed in me. She believed I'm strong. I'm a survivor. I will make it. Although as smart she was, she did not believe that Hitler, that the Germans can do what they really did to other human beings just because they had different eyes, just because they were a different religion and so. You probably know, and we all know, that the Jews were good citizens of Germany. Many of them said, Ich bin Deutsche Faust and Jude later, which means I am German Faust and a Jew later. But that didn't help. Many Jews fought in World War I and had really uh, uh, good and very good achievements. They were doctors and lawyers and musicians and top intelligent people did a lot for Germany. Nothing did count. Even if you had one thought, that means a great grandmother or so had, was Jewish, you were still branded as a Jew. Well, I jumped from the train. We went to that, gem, to that Polish family. We stayed there for four weeks in the barn. And even during our stay, we were taken to the house to take a bath once or twice, my father and I. And the other man went to his friends. And he subsequently got killed, we got the news, by walking from one place to another. And one day, Anielka Koje, she passed away soon after. She should be a, in, the, in the saint category. She came up and she said, you have to leave. There are rumors that we say the Koje is a hiding Jews. They had two other girls on their property, but we didn't know about it. You shouldn't know. They didn't know about us too. Because if you get caught, which was a really chance, you might, you know, tell. But if you don't know, no matter how much beating you get, and I got it, don't tell. You don't tell even if you know, because you know what's at stake. She got in touch with a Polish family, good friends of my grandfather, whose two sons were in the Polish underground. The older one, one was wor working for the German employment agency. He made false papers, so-called Aryan papers. He made papers for me. He probably made papers for others, too. And I was taken by the younger son, Witold Monchak. I never met even the older one to Yaroslav to get into a group of young Polish boys and girls to go to Germany to work. And the reason they took Polish youngsters to work to Germany, because they, a youth, was taken to the army and they needed people to work in the land, the farms, and so on. Well, the other two girls to Germany, survived as Polish girls, came back, one passed away, one is still alive and kicking in Connecticut. I had a different kind of destination. I was somehow recognized by somebody on the train, squealed on me, 
taken out from the group, beaten up, like when I was hit in the right, uh, yeah, in the right ear, blood came out through the left, I lost consciousness, I was pushed out, out with the foot outside, it was at night. I don't know how long I was there, motionless. And when I was taken back in after a while, I was told, tomorrow will kill you. I understood that, of course, I did nothing. I couldn't do anything. So I was just sitting there. I was put to jail for overnight. The next day in the morning, a Polish policeman took me to the Gestapo. I still had my watch, and I offered that Polish policeman the watch to let me go. And he said to me, with you a face, black and blue and swollen, you can't go far. You, whoever will catch you and bring you somewhere, your destiny, your end will be voice and wherever I, the policeman, has taken me. Yes, I got to the Gestapo. I was there for a day. And then the Jewish policeman from the Krakow ghetto, from the jail of the Krakow ghetto, came for me and took me to the Krakow ghetto jail. I was there for about four weeks or five weeks when the Krakow ghetto was liquidated. The Krakow ghetto was, had many partial liquidation, many partial uh, people taken out to Auschwitz because Krakow in Auschwitz isn't that far. It's about a little over an hour's ride. I was there several times after the war. Well, the Krakow ghetto was liquidated, and we, the young people, boys and girls, or men and women, about 300, were taken out the last one. We stood in the back and we saw what was going on on that Umschlagplatz, the square in Krakow, where they just got together all those people. And if, if, you can describe hell, that was sheer, sure hell. Young people, young men were taken separately. They were taken to work yet at a nearby workplace. The older one, but still able-bodied, still able to work and to live a decent life. They were loaded on trucks, open trucks, daytime. And those trucks were designated to go to Auschwitz, or rather to Auschwitz number two, which was also known as Birkenau. We were the last one. We saw what was going on. And the dogs were barking. The music was playing. The German officials were giving orders left, right, right, left. And what a horrible sight when a young mother gives her little child, little baby, to her mother, to the grandmother, so she can maybe cho be chosen to go to work. With a baby on your arms, you had no chance. That was that. Well, we were the last one to load on trucks and to to taken to Auschwitz, to Birkenau. And when we came to Birkenau, and we saw the flames, like from here to the wall, and we smelled the smell of the burning bodies of our brethren, but we stood there stoned with no emotion whatsoever. There was nothing to do. Absolutely nothing. There were so many soldiers and so many things. And I'll never forget, never forget that, that scene where one of us, one of those caught on the outside of the ghetto, which was not allowed to be, a Jew, and she was a little older, but other than that, healthy and normal. And she was going, holding on to the, uh, to the group, 
that she was taken out and going with her second arm like that to her dad. She knew where she was going. I'll never forget that. But when it came to us, a group of young people, young women, and the men were separated altogether. We were put, taken to barracks for overnight. I don't know why. Either the crematoria were overfilled or overworked or the hour was like such. We were put on the floors for overnight and next day in the morning, we were all taken to a real shower. Unbelievable, because there was a big sign on the entrance to the, to the place where they really showered the people, showered the Jewish people with gas, cyclone B, and that was the last death. That what say the last minutes of life that they met there was also a sign that they are going to take a bath. When we were taking a really shower, none of us believed. Of course, we were all young and good look. Good looking, when I say good looking, is we were still able bodies, like to work. Well, we got undressed, put our clothing very nicely in squares, got real shower. And after that, our hair was shorn. We almost didn't recognize each other, and we knew each other for about three or four weeks already. And then we got tattoos. And I got a tattoo, too. It's toidy A, three toidy. And you can see it later on when you walk out. I don't know how far I can walk now. OK. Thank you. And below the number, there is also a triangle. And that triangle means we were rebels. We did not want to obey Hitler's orders. We came from a jail, so we are double trouble. Not only we were Jews, but we were also rebels. Well, the life in the Auschwitz started for me and others. We were the first one to a new block, to a clean block. And we had to go to work. You probably heard or you read the lie of the life in Auschwitz. If you can call this life, I don't know. You had to get up 5 o'clock or so in the morning, stay in line to be counted. And if anybody died during the night or couldn't maybe go down from the bunks, we were standing so long in the rain or shine till the amount was correct. The Germans are very, were, and are very, very precise. The fact is, a lot of those uh, things that happened, that they were recorded by the Germans. Well. Then we had some breakfast, which consisted of a little water, dark water, if that was tea or coffee. I wouldn't know the difference, not then and not now. But we came up with a great idea. We were four or five girls, and we washed our faces in that water, in that coffee. And every day, one other girl gave her her cup of coffee to wash the faces. And then we gave her a little bit of that warm water to drink, because that was the breakfast. And that was good. That was a great idea, believe it or not. Because it made our faces brownish. We looked healthier. We had another chance for another day of work. And tomorrow, fully, it'll be a better tomorrow. The war will end. That's the only hope there was. Well, then we went to work. And as I mentioned before, 
we were escorted by assessment and you didn't and dogs and you didn't know who was more vicious. You had to go in line and if you didn't, the dog pulled a, a part of your pants or a part of your leg. We worked at a menial, very menial works. We cleaned the breeze and we were just pushing those bottles back and forth to get tired and not only physically tired, of course we did, but also emotionally tired. But there was nothing, nothing you could do. Absolutely nothing. Then it was lunch and you was lucky that you got a little soup and that you were not only in your bowl, not only in your bowl, but also on your hand. And then there was more working. And there was more working and going back to the camp and more counting. And we had a little break, uh, a little dinner, which was a slice of bread that you could see through. Once a month or so, we got also a little slice of margarine. And you did not know if you shall eat it right now and then, or maybe you shall keep a little piece for tomorrow morning. And sometimes that piece of bread never lasted till tomorrow morning because it was also stolen from you. Well, life was unbearable, indescribable. There were no toilets and no running water, and many of the inmates were kicked in into those the ravines of dirt and, this, and by German soldiers. And we, we have, the inmates, have built or helped to build roads, the wa running water, and the toilets. And the roads were so muddy that in the fall, when the rains were falling and you stepped in, you not only could pull out your shoe, but even your leg was an ordeal to pull out. Well, I was lucky again. Oh, I was lucky in many, many ways, many smaller incidents, but one of them I'll mention. When the war started to decline and Hitler, in favor of, the, uh, of America and all the others, Hitler started to pull back. He also started to clean up his dirty work, at least he tried. Like Belzitz, the, the, the camp, that I was taken in and I was jumped for, otherwise I would not have been here because there are no survivors from Belzitz, because there were also Belzitz consumed about five to six hundred thousand Jews from the southeastern part of Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Russia, part of Russia, Hung Hungary, and so there was and some also from Belgium and Holland, there were no survivors. There was death on arrival, and the only reason I survived, and the only reason my father survived, is because we jumped before we got Belzitz. I was lucky enough in, Bel in Auschwitz, because when Hitler started to liquidate the smaller camps, and started to liquidate it, to liquidate also Auschwitz, I and 500 other able bodies yet were taken to Mary Schweizwasser, a labor camp in Czechoslovakia. Life was different there. The reason, we were only 500. The war was coming to an end and obviously the German soldiers or the women who supervised the camp and so, when knowing what was going on. So they were maybe a little lenient. We also worked in a nearby ammunition factory and the Czechoslovakian 
who worked there, they spoke, of course, German, and I spoke German too. And although we weren't allowed to speak to each other, they were walking the aisles and speaking loud. So we overheard. And if anybody understood, I did. And we knew that the war is coming to an end. Now, how will end? And we knew that Hitler is losing. How will end for us, we never knew. To the very last day, to the very last minute, we didn't know if we will be put in the air, point alive, or whatever. But one day, one morning, we woke up and the guards were gone. And the guards were usually older German soldiers who were who weren't fit anymore to be on the front, they were gone. There was a lot of joy, a lot of crying. Most of us knew what happened to our loved ones. We also were two and three years behind the bars, behind life. We were all young and getting older, and we also did not know how and where to start. There was that fear, but we were rejoicing. People from the nearby villages brought us some food or took two and three little girls to, to their homes for supper. And slowly, we had potatoes on the ground, so we cooked and we ate. And slowly but surely, we started to leave the camps and go to Prague, the capital of Czechoslovakia. And what a sight. From all over, there were so many people coming, creeping, barely walking. The one who could not walk were taken to hospitals and sanatoriums. I, for one, had made friends. You have to make friends. You have to. People need people. You cannot be alone. And while other people had some friends from the same city or town, or even some relatives, I was a stranger from the East. So here I had nobody, but I had made friends. We were five young women. Two from Czechoslovakia and two in I, which is three, was three from Poland. And after we got, we registered, we got ID cards, we had some kind of a place where to stay and a meal. And we were lucky because we had breakfast in that hospital or whatever where we stayed. Also, uh, People stayed in schools and churches and synagogues and whatever, because I want you to know, for whatever reason, Prague was not bombed at all. We visited, we walked all over, we, we tried to find some friends. And then the three of us, the two from Czechoslovakia remained in Czechoslovakia. One did find a uncle who lived in Prague before the war, was married to a Gentile woman and had two children. But when Hitler came to power, he escaped. He just vanished, went into hiding, and officially divorced his wife. So the wife could have stayed in her house or her apartment where she was. Well, she found him, and he was a little helpful to give us an easier shelter in Prague. The three of us from Poland decided to go back to Poland. Everybody, everybody was thinking that we are out of our mind, because un unbelievable, even after the war, where there were very few Jews in Poland. Of course, some were, tried to come back from Siberia. But even then, 
there was anti-Semitism. And you hear often about anti-Semitism. It's an old, old, very old disease, like it preps up and goes down, depends on the government many times. And there were pogroms already in Poland after the war. People were killed when they came back to their town. Nevertheless, we decided to go back to Poland. I left my father and didn't know what's happened to him for two and a half years. Neither did he know about me. They left some friends or relatives too in the nearby Polish cities nearby the border, German border. We went back. We registered there, we got IDs. And what did we do? We walked in the streets and we were looking everybody in the faces. If we find somebody we know, maybe a relative, maybe just from our town or cities, there was no mail or telephone for the private people. And yes, I did find my future husband in Polish, the Polish people, Katowice. And just by looking for, for somebody, for anybody, well, we knew each other because we knew each other, other's families. We came from the same town at one time or another. We lived in different cities also too. And well, we exchanged news. And he told me that my father is alive. It took yet more than two months till father and I got together because father went east, uh, went west, and I went east to look for him. But we did find each other eventually. And one of the girls, you are ready for left. One of the girls said, and he has already a boyfriend. And about, uh, well, that was in June probably of 45. And in April of 46, we got married. Subsequently, we came to the United States. We have one daughter, college professor, Suzanne Sepperson, Blyborg Bly Sepperson. I have three beautiful grandchildren and two great grandchildren. They are delicious. <laughs> uh, they are. You just don't hear it from the mouth of a great grandmother, but they are. <clears throat> Well, I went back four times to Poland, thanks to my daughter. I did not, after the war, I did not want to go. I was afraid, I, I just, that I will not be able to, to face the situation. But I did, and I was lucky enough to find two Polish people that helped me helped my husband, who wasn't my husband before the war, my father. We became family because that woman, Helka Fiotowska, who is unfortunately gone already, had a family too. And her grandchildren, who didn't speak a word of English, became my friends or the friends of my grandchildren, who didn't speak a word of Polish. Subsequently, the Polish people know now and speak now English. My kids don't speak Polish. Maybe one or two words here and there, but not much Polish. Well, one of those men, Tolek Monchak, moved to Canada and we visited frequently. He and his family came to my youngest grandson, Stevens Bar Mitzvah. And of course, he got all the honors, really, that was due to him. He too passed away about a year ago. Well, I would not, I did speak twice at the Jagiellonska University in Krakow, which was and is a, one of the oldest universities and very well respected universities in Poland and in Europe. There is a book written with many different chapters from many different people, my daughters, my, and so on. I, 
consider myself very, very lucky, very lucky, because I not only survived, because I also have a beautiful family, because I have friends like you, and I do speak to young and older, and I do try to tell them not just my experiences, but I try to tell you all, learn, study, you never know what you'll be able to use. And knowledge, education is key to success. This is what my mother was telling me, and she just gave me that idea. Education, education, education. You can and you will help not just yourself, but your families. You are mankind. You make a better tomorrow for everybody. And we need this. And never, ever give up. Never, ever give up. I never gave up. If I would have given up for one second, I wouldn't be here today. And I feel very, very lucky that I am here today. And I do speak a lot to young and old churches, synagogues. I just, last week, I spoke in the Dowling College to students. Uh, well, I, I spoke to the army in, in the Bronx last spring. I do speak a lot. I feel I owe it to the, to the people, to the Almighty. I owe it to speak to people, to educate them to give him hope and to give him maybe my own feeling of the urge of survival, of the need of survival, and to talk to people, to learn from yesterday, it should not happen again. And unfortunately, yes, it happened again here and there and everywhere, but a much, much smaller version than the Holocaust. Six million Jews perished. A million and a half children were killed. 10, 11 million people, Jews and non-Jews, were killed on the battlefield just because of one crazy man, Hitler. So beware of who is on the helm of your government or any other governments, and do your utmost, utmost. Be involved, and you will, even a small inch, but you will make a better tomorrow. I wouldn't feel that I finished my speech, I never will, uh, if I would not mention my dream. When I was hiding at the Koshis in the barn, and Anelka Koshi came and said, we have to leave. And while my father was ready to go to another ghetto, there wasn't many where to go, I was tired. And that was maybe the only one time that I sort of succumbed and almost gave up. I wanted to go to the police and get, I would have been killed right there and then. But that Anelka Koji could not make peace with herself. I, who was a friend of their only daughter, who was about a year or two younger, I, who helped trim the Christmas tree there, the two mothers were very, very good friends, close friends. Jewish and non-Jewish. When I, I dreamt that dream, when I had nowhere to go, 
I saw my grandfather who was dead already, but I didn't know. And he was marching with a long, long line of Jews dressed in white and singing or praying and going like up to the sky. And when I saw him, I wanted to run after him. No wonder. I was all alone and no place to go. But when he noticed my moves, and this is on that picture that I made a collage. I have a very big one, but that was, is too hard to carry. I broke the glass several times, so I decided to make a small version of it. But you can all see it. If you want to, you can take it down and pass it on. And when my grandfather saw me sort of moving or trying to move towards him, he turned to me and with his finger said in Yiddish, but you stay here. Well, I woke up. I was still in the barn and still nowhere to go. But I firmly believe, I firmly believe that thanks to his somehow divine intervention, I can't explain it any other way. I survived. And I survived many, many incidents that I was so close, like an arm's length close to my perpetrator, to, to that. But when I finally opened my eyes, that thing changed, the scene changed, and I was going on, and I'm here today. And so I thank you all for listening. Thank you all for taking notes, even in your mind, to do something to work for a better tomorrow. There's never anything too little or too meaningless. We all can do and should do the very best we can. And I wish you, I wish you good luck. Thanks again for listening. And if you have any questions, any questions, please ask. Thank you. Thank you.